Uh, Casey Dunn is Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and he is the Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at Yale's Peabody Museum of Natural History. Uh, he's PhD, class of 2005, and his lab studies animal evolution with a particular focus on better understanding of our most distant animal relatives and the earliest events in the animal tree of life. The lab's research includes field work to collect poorly known animals, often scuba diving, and sometimes with remotely operated underwater vehicles. Lab bench work includes studies of anatomy and genome function. Much of his work is computational, developing methods and tools for analyzing evolutionary relationships and using those relationships to provide an integrated perspective on genomic and anatomical evolution. In addition to his studies of broad patterns of diversity across distantly related animals, his lab also focuses on, oh, I'm gonna say this wrong, siphinophores, a group of about 185 species of open ocean animals that include the Portuguese man of war. He and his team address basic questions about Zephinophore structure, growth, diversity, and evolution. He is the co-author of Practical Computing for Biologists, which helps more biologists become comfortable with computational methods. Professor Dunn completed his undergraduate studies at Stanford University, but we don't hold that against him, <laughs> followed by his graduate studies at Gunter Wagner at Yale and postdoctoral work with Mark Martindale at the University of Hawaii. Welcome, Professor Dunn. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. And do you want to correct my pronunciation of Stenophore? Uh, yeah, well, we could uh, talk about a couple of words. So uh, siphonophores Thank are the you. group of animals uh, that I study. So uh, these include the Portuguese man of war, but many other deep sea animals. And when I'm out studying siphonophores and other uh, jellyfish, I routinely encounter cephalopods. So they're a great love of mine, even though they're not my primary uh, focus of study. Uh, and uh, there is this raging debate about uh, <laughs> Uh, the plural of octopus. And the general thinking is that the plural is octopuses, since octopus is Greek, and uh, the I at the end would be the Latin mode of making a plural. So you'll usually hear octopuses. So we've so. either settled this or we've set off a raging debate in the chat. Yeah, I don't think we're going to settle it. I, I think it will rage on. So, but. And before we start the film, Professor Dunn, is there anything you want to say to open the, open the set? Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, it's interesting with nature documentaries for me because uh, it is work, you know, so I go out and I get to scuba dive all, all day during uh, these field trips and uh, sometimes it's a little hard to come back and watch something that's been spliced together of a bunch of shots to make some sort of sequence or something. So I actually put off watching this until my kids bugged me uh, to see it. And I was blown away. It uh, feels to me to be one of the most honest uh, nature documentaries I've seen in a long time that just really creates a, uh, a sense of what it's like to, to be out with the organisms and interact with them. Uh, and so I will that's all I have to say before I look forward to questions afterwards. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to go on ahead and turn it over to Anthony to roll the film. We're going to watch the film. And once it finishes, we're going to open to Q&A. Hi, Professor Dunn. And Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking with us with, throughout that film. Um, boy, it gets emotional at the end, doesn't it? And I and there was someone who um, messaged me in the middle of the film and said, I really hope that uh, she doesn't get distracted by him and get eaten by a shark in the middle of the movie. And I have to say that was, um, you know, something that I thought about as well. I was sort of biting my nails when I watched it the first time. And, and thankfully, it, it follows a much more natural progression. Um, although in the end, you know, we still, we get to see the full life cycle of, of the animal. So uh, I want to invite everyone to put their questions in the Q&A box. 
so that we can get to your questions. We have about a half an hour to talk together. There are 300 of us here. So um, we certainly won't get to everybody's questions, but we'll get through as, as many of them as we can. So any questions you have, put in the Q&A. And before we go to the questions, Professor Dunn, I'll just let you open with any comments that you wanna start us off with. Yeah, uh, again, I just thought this was a, a beautiful film. So I think a lot of people don't realize when you're watching a nature documentary, it's incredibly hard to get these shots. And usually what people do uh, is they'll stitch together a montage really, that is a sequence of shots, often of completely different animals, sort of working towards building a story. So it could be something that absolutely does happen, like a pack of lions taking down a, a wildebeest or something, uh, but you just can't get the right shots. So, so you uh, might take you know, 20 different lions over, you know, 30 different uh, kill attempts and, and put it together into a story. Uh, so my understanding of this film and, and everything that I see in it is consistent with it really being the story of one octopus. And there's a few things like after the arm gets bitten off, you can see the, the um, arm regenerating in the other shots. And uh, obviously this is a, a very uh, observative <laughs> uh, uh, diver. Um, I mean, he's, he's fantastic. He really knows the, the site. And uh, he he was present really before the story start started. I think that's really key. He knew the environment, uh, and he was receptive uh, to what ended up happening with with the octopus. And this is really storytelling about the natural world uh, at its at its best. Really excellent work by by this film team. Thank you for that setup. And there are quite a few questions on the technicalities of how the film was made, how he did the diving, um, how he you know, captured the images and so forth. And because we have a limited time, I'm gonna refer those questions to the film's actual website, which has mm -hmm. a lot of um, a full breakdown. Actually, there's a PDF you can download that it really explains a lot of the details of how they actually did this. And I also wanna say that we um, have the luxury of watching this film together as a group, thanks to Netflix, which offered an educational license um, for organizations like Yale to do a one-time screening for us. Um, I wanna open with, with a question from Benjamin, who asked, can an animal with such a primitive nervous system really strategize and connect with a human the way he anthropomorph anthropomorphizes it? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. Uh, and there's actually a lot to unpack there. Uh, so uh, for one thing, I'll, I'll I'll talk about nervous systems a little bit for a couple of minutes, because I think it's really relevant um, here to understanding uh, that question and so much more about the issues that were raised in the film. So we share a common ancestor with the octopus uh, somewhere in the, in, in the, the uh, on the order of 600 million years ago. So that's a long time ago. And based on what we know about the diversity of nervous systems in uh, many other groups of animals uh, that we diverge from about that point in time, it's pretty clear that yes, that most recent common ancestor had nerves and there's features of our nerves that are shared with the octopus, but it wasn't a strongly centralized nervous system. Uh, so what I mean by that is that there was a, a network of neurons probably, and maybe some, some uh, fibers that had multiple neurons. And it was thought for a long time that we could look across the animals we see today and sort of treat our most distant animal relatives as if they were our ancestors. So take a sponge, it has no nerves. Uh, and then we could look at worms or, or uh, jellyfish, for example, where there's just a complete net. There's nothing resembling a brain or any centralization. Uh, and then take a worm that ha might have a little bit uh, of a condensation of nerves in its head, but not much more. And really we looked at that diversity of animals today and ordered it in the stepwise fashion as if it told us the history of our own path. And a lot of the work that we're 
doing now where we can use genomes and things to learn about the evolutionary relationships between the animals and also the molecular underpinnings of things like the nervous system, what we're learning is that that, that idea that we can go from uh, simple primitive nervous systems in some animals that we see today to our nervous system is completely wrong. And wow. in fact, there have been multiple gains and losses of neurological sophistication across the entire tree of life. And actually, some of the work we do in my lab has turned out to be really relevant to this. We, we weren't seeking out the story, but it turns out that it's quite probable that sponges are not even our most distant animal relative and that our most distant animal relative is these things called comb jellies that do have nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And since we've gotten that result, people have learned more about their nervous systems and are quite different from the nervous systems of all other animals. So either the comb jellies completely evolved a nervous system anew uh, or our most recent common ancestor with them had a nervous system and that was then lost in the sponges. So there's lots of details, but what we're learning is that nervous system complexity is gained and lost. And uh, we have had the exact same amount of time to evolve as a jellyfish has. Wow. So it's not that a jellyfish uh, is a snapshot in, in deep history of evolutionary time of, of what nervous systems were like then, it's that we have a very different way of life from a jellyfish. We have a very different way of life from an octopus. Uh, what we do, uh, uh, having a large brain serves us well. I, and for a sponge, which glues itself to a rock and pumps water through its body, it doesn't need a nervous system. In fact, the nervous system would be an unnecessary cost. So instead of this idea that like a nervous system is this really desirable thing to have in all circumstances and that you want as complex a brain as possible. And if you don't have it, it's just because you didn't innovate it and you're missing out. Uh, it doesn't explain the diversity of life we see today. And so to bring that back to the cephalopods, which include the octopus. So the cephalopods are like nautilus and squid and the octopus and their relatives. What makes this so interesting is that they also have this mobile life cycle where they're doing or, uh, or lifestyle where they're doing pre-planning. We could, we, could, we could see the octopus uh, gaming the shark, getting on its back obviously able to project into the future what was going to happen, uh, we have a complex nervous system uh, a, with, with a, uh, with, that's highly visual, uh, uh, evolving separately in that group of animals. So that is a completely independent mm -hmm. origin of a, a nervous system that shares some, some features uh, with ours. So in that way, I would say that the octopus nervous system isn't primitive. It's very different from the nervous system that was in the common ancestor we share with the octopus in the same way that ours isn't primitive. It's, it's also very different from that uh, nervous system. So what does that tell us about, you know, there are these moments where he says, um, you know, the, the crab, for example, when the crab is evading her attack, he says, the crab thinks it's in the clear. You know, what does that tell us about that anthropomorphized? Yeah, this this is show? this is uh, really great. I mean, this gets to these questions of of consciousness and subjective experience. So uh, I could say, you know, uh, what does it mean to be? you know, you, Lauren Suffers, you have no idea of what it means to be me. Like, I don't know, you know, if if the world that you see is the same as the world that I see, and we're both humans. So right. it's, right. It's, um, it's really interesting to then sort of zoom out and, and uh, look more broadly and think about that. I think there's a couple of things going on here. One is that as we make sense, of the natural world around us, it makes sense to read intent 
everywhere because that's that that is our subjective experience. So so we go through the world uh, with um, with intent often, where we're going to cause a particular outcome or something like that. And I would say that we even read intent into inanimate things that clearly can't have it. You know, we'll talk about the intent of water flowing downhill or something like that. So that's one way that we we use those those terms. Um, but clearly, the octopus here, uh, in in particular, uh, th there's there's several things that I think really allow us to empathize very strongly with them. Uh, I think one of the most important is this sense of play. So anyone who has spent time with a octopus uh, soon realizes they're not entirely, you know, task driven as far as just getting the next meal. There's some sort of give and take in the way that they're experimenting with their environment in the same way that a kid, you know, will will drop its cup off of, you know, their cup off of the high chair uh, to just sort of see how gravity works, see what happens with the fish uh, when you wave at them. So, so there's that sense of probing the world around you and, and learning and, from And it. curiosity. Absolutely. So you can, you can absolutely see uh, that curiosity uh, in them. Um, and so there's a lot of questions in general about the nervous system. So it's, it's we think of the nervous system as this master control center. So like in our, in, uh, you know, we, we think of our bodies being controlled by our brains, but there's lots of animals. Uh, well, for example, sponges have behavior. Uh, it's slower, but you can watch them sneeze and things if, if you uh, uh, watch them long enough. Uh, so they have behavior, but they don't have a nervous system. So cells can act collectively. Uh, there's many single-celled organisms that have behavior. Plants have behavior. Uh, but the nervous system may have initially served a purpose, not as the master control center, but just to facilitate coordination of that behavior at, and, and sort of maybe make it more consistent in places. And then perhaps uh, later on, uh, once you had that diffuse coordination capacity, then you had the evolution uh, of, of the ability to actually initiate whole uh, 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 behaviors in a, in a more centralized way. And then out of that later on, we get these subjective experiences. Well, and I found it really interesting, you know, when you speak about the nervous system, when he, he, he re referred to each of her suction cups as sort of a finger, you know, and you have this creature yeah. and that the fingers have kind of a level of intelligence in them because yes. it is a diffused nervous system throughout, you know, all of the age. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so mollusks, they, many mollusks and, and the animals that they're related to, like uh, annelid worms and things, they tend to have this ladder like nervous system. So instead of having one um, central nerve cord like 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 we do there's a couple of them and then there's these nerves running across so that's sort of the general framework and what's happened is that the at the at the front end of the nervous system in uh, the octopi, those have really fused a bunch of those rungs in the ladder into a, a um, into something we call brain. And to be totally clear, we call it a brain, but it, it we probably don't share it with the brain and our common ancestor. It's the independent sort of. Uh, uh, expansion of a local region into a complex um, neurological structure. But one amazing difference with their brain and ours is our esophagus. So my mouth is underneath my brain and then my esophagus runs under it. In the cephalopods, their esophagus goes right through their brain. So when they swallow, the food is actually going through the middle of their brain. And the part of their brain that's above the esophagus tends to be involved in perception, uh, in, in processing the information from the eyes. And then the part below is involved in motor control. But exactly as you say, a lot of the motor control and even some of the sensory feedback is happening out in the arms. So they have much more of that. Of course, we have reflexes, there are things our nervous system can do without the central nervous system, but it's just far more pronounced than them. 
really, that can raise so many fascinating questions that we could think about. Um, and I want to point out, because you're referring to uh, sort of the evolutionary process and our connection to these animals and our ancestral evolution, I want to point out that we did another um, webinar with your colleague, uh, Thomas Neer, who is also at the Peabody Museum, and also thanks to the Peabody Museum for connecting us with both of you. And he talked about the biodiversity and evolution of fishes and, you know, pointed mm -hmm. out that we all sort of have evolved from fishes. And I encourage people, if you're curious about this topic, um, he does a lot to talk about the family tree and how that took place over time. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to I want to go to another question. Lisa Davis asks, is there any sense whether this was an exceptional octopus or could it be any octopus? And I also want to, before you answer that, a couple of people have asked, it, did this film, is this a real story or is this a fictional account? And, and as far as we understand, unless there was some kind of dubiousness behind the scenes, this is a documentary and it's the real story of um, this man's relationship with this animal uh, shot over time. So I just wanted to kind of give that context for people who were, who were questioning, you know, how did this actually happen? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in the documentary, you know, you have the, the subject material that's there, and then there's there's ways that the person who's presenting the story is curating that to highlight and tell a particular story. Uh, so he wasn't intending, my understanding, uh, to make a documentary when he first got the video sequence. So they did have to pick a narrative arc and then, and then uh, go with that. But it feels very true to, to you know, what an experience with an octopus uh, could be. And this point of being a particular octopus, uh, you know, I not, well, I love Mr. Rogers. So like every octopus is special, right? <laughs> I, I think, uh, and one thing that we're learning uh, is that the personality of animals really matters. So mm -hmm. there's, there's this real tendency when we study animals in the wild um, to sort of assume that they're more uniform than people are and that they're almost like a widget. And if you look at a lot of the types of data that are collected for someone, for example, someone will look at a flock of birds and then they'll record you know, you can imagine someone with a notebook saying like, oh, among those birds I saw, there's, there's 63 birds today. I saw 20 feeding attempts on this. I saw uh, 15 feeding attempts on that. I saw an attack on this bird. And it's all in aggregate like that. But that doesn't tell you, for example, is each individual bird foraging for multiple types of prey? Uh, or is do the birds within that specialize? And a, a really exciting thing that's happening right now is as, uh, for example, tracking devices and data collecting devices get a lot smaller and lighter weight and the battery life gets longer, we can put them on individual animals mm -hmm. and we can collect data on individual experiences. And also, uh, the uh, deep learning tools that are used for video processing uh, are also turning out to be really helpful because now you can put a camera, for example, uh, on a, a school of fish in a lab and you can follow every single individual fish for its entire life. Wow. And maybe we shouldn't be so surprised, but it turns out when we move from that aggregate perspective to this individual perspective, there's far more variation than we expected. So in that respect, uh, you know, most animals are different from, from the average animal. Uh, well, they essentially all are. And uh, there's tremendous uh, importance in that personality uh, of the animal. And some of that might be genetic, but some might also uh, reflect the, the learned experiences of that animal through its life. So um, you talked about learned experiences there. I want to go to um, Sung Hee Iwu's question. Um, wondering, do you think that our narrator in the film, um, 
do you think that in his interaction with the octopus that she ever wondered whether he would intervene for her as she's running from the shark? And the reason why I think it's such an interesting question is there's this moment in the film where she's, she's strategizing how to get the lobster and he says mm-hmm. that he realizes that she's using him mm-hmm. in her hunting strategy to position him in a place to kind of corner the lobster. So she does have an awareness of his role in her survival and her, you know, her strategic moving through the kelp forest. Yeah, isn't that a great question? Uh, all the more interesting because octopuses for most of their life are very solitary animals. So, so but yet there seems to be this, this implicit like reciprocity, you know, I, I expected in that particular encounter where, you know, she's, she's uh, allowing the, uh, him to intervene there. Um, there is this interaction uh, and this is a social interaction. Uh, I had the exact same thought watching this a second time was she just sitting there saying, why aren't you doing anything? <laughs> Obviously just not? kick the shark. Uh, and you know, this is a question that comes up all the time, for example, in journalists re- reporting on, uh, you know, disadvantaged populations and, and things, you know, when when do you intervene? This is such a hard question. Uh, I was just talking to a marine biologist friend of mine about this film, and he was saying, I couldn't believe it. I would have been all over that shark, you know. Uh, I. I think that if it hadn't been for the film, my guess is by that time he knew it was making a film, I, it would be so difficult to not intervene. And yeah, I, I do expect that, you know, well, here I am. I'm the, I, I, not speaking as a scientist, but speaking as an animal with a brain, I'm sure that that octopus was wondering uh, what was going on. <laughs> oh, so, when she jumped up on land, maybe she was trying yeah, to get in land. Right. Hey. <laughs> Um, could I share a couple of quick things? Yeah, I actually absolutely. brought some specimens in from the Peabody. So the Peabody has this long history of very important work on um, on cephalopods. So again, that's the group that includes octopus and things. So here's an octopus vulgaris. This is a specimen of the same species that, wow. that was uh, examined there. Uh, and uh, one thing that they didn't explain uh, in the film was how the mating works, which is is so interesting. And so, we had a lot of questions about that, so that's great. Okay, great. So uh, it turns out that in a male, uh, the third arm down, I believe it's on the right, so it'd be down here, becomes modified. And when the male generates sperm, he actually puts them in a packet. So it's, it's called a spermatophore. And he reaches with this modified arm, grabs the spermatophore out of himself, and then places it in the mantle. And the mantle is uh, this, this inside area of sort of the, the, the visceral uh, mass here. It's, it's what takes in the water before it's jetted out. And he actually reaches in the female and then uh, places it uh, in, inside of her. And then uh, the uh, fertilization, when she releases the eggs into the mantle, the, the, um, the sperm will, will fertilize them. And you know, the other really compelling thing about the, the life cycle and the biology of the octopus is this, you know, extraordinary, um, well, I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to use the word extraordinary. This, this, uh, this very um, striking aspect of, of their biology, which is that they invest all the resources into a single clutch of babies and, mm-hmm. and then they die. And uh, this is actually not entirely uncommon. It's the, the term for this is, is to be semel paris. And it means you, you put all your, your uh, eggs in one basket, literally. So, so you put all your reproductive effort into a single um, uh, clutch. And it tends to be seen in animals with, with uh, very high fecundity. And there's a sense like, what a tragedy. Why would the animal purposefully die. Uh, And uh, another colleague in the Department here of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, uh, Steve Stearns, pointed out that these organisms are not programmed for death. They're programmed for extreme reproductive effort. And a side effect of that 
is death. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, they're essentially once they put so much into that one clutch of eggs to hold back for maybe in another year, being able to have another clutch of eggs on average, doesn't work out as well as just giving it uh, your all for that, that single uh, clutch of eggs. And as uh, you're, um, as you're speaking on that, a couple of questions, it, how did, how did we know that that was a female in the film? Like, okay, she reproduces at the end, but how do you distinguish the male from the female? And, and does the male also um, die after reproducing or is the male life cycle completely different? So uh, the males will mate multiple times, but they're not, they don't live a lot longer uh, than, than the females do. Uh, there's some behavioral differences between the, the males and females. That's the most conspicuous way to tell them apart because otherwise you'd have to pick them up and see if they have this modified arm and things and that, that would be uh, very disruptive. My guess is like, actually they didn't start editing this movie until the octopus was dead. So they already knew at that point <laughs> that, that it was gonna lay eggs. Did you have any other specimens that you wanted to share? Yeah, I did. I so a, uh, a few things yeah. that are really fun. So here's a, a chambered nautilus shell. So this is this other group of cephalopods. Uh, they have like 90 tentacles, but they're uh, detritivores. So, so they're feeding, they're scavenging uh, on, on stuff. Uh, and they have the shell and they partially inflate it with gas to counteract uh, the negative buoyancy. And I hope to contrast that with this Argonaut egg case. This is a egg case that an octopus makes and can crawl into. And she um, makes it by excreting the minerals with special modified arms. So this is also called a paper nautilus, but it's not a nautilus. It's an it's a octopus. And then uh, of course, the largest invertebrate of all is the giant squid. So this is called Archaeotuthis. Uh, this is the legendary kraken of Norse mythology. Uh, all sorts of uh, different um, folk traditions speak of these giant squid sea monsters. And Verrill, who founded the Division of Invertebrate Zoology, uh, where I'm now curator, was very involved in the original descriptions of these. And this is a jar from 1874, I believe it is. This is the beak of a giant squid. Wow. And it has this sandpaper-like tongue inside of it. So this is this, this giant thing. And just to give you some sense of scale, I actually brought in... Uh, a tentacle here of a, of a giant squid. So these are the largest invertebrates. They can get to be tens of meters of long. And this is a, a tentacle of uh, one of the giant squid that washed up in New England. And you can see the tentacle, the suckers are up here on, on uh, the tip there. So many curiosities to explore on a trip to the Peabody Museum. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I want to, since you've shared this with us, I wanted to give a shout out to um, Mike from Guam, who was with us today, um, YSC class of 1970, Yale College class of 68, who was retired chief of marine resources at the Federated States of Micronesia when he was oh, a that's student fantastic. at Yale. He helped to build the fiberglass giant squid at the Peabody Museum. Yeah, such a <laughs> such a wonderful uh, model. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, we had tons of great questions and lots of good conversation. I hope that means that we can have you back, Professor Dunn. I'd love to. To yeah. do a presentation for us. Yeah. Well, thanks for picking such a great film for us to watch today. Well, it, would, it wouldn't have been the same without having you to help us understand what we were seeing. And thank you, uh, everyone who participated. A couple of questions that have come in. This film is available for streaming via Netflix. Um, we have recorded this conversation, so it will be available on our Yale Alumni Academy uh, website within the next several days. The film will not be part of the recording because we could only show it once. So you'll wanna watch it yourself on Netflix if you wanna revisit the conversation. Um, and with that, I will thank you for joining this latest installment of our festival. And I will see you hopefully again for the last session this week. And thank you, Professor Casey Dunn for joining us. Any final remarks you wanna close with? 
Oh, I just want to say thanks for everyone uh, joining today. It's always really fun uh, to talk about this. And one thing I love about natural history is you don't have to be a specialist in these animals uh, to really connect with these stories. It's it's so exciting. And, you know, this was a guy who went down to the water where he lived and observed things that were new to science. Uh, and that's something that we can actually all do in the world around us. Like, like not all the species are described. We don't know everything about all the species. Uh, you know, this is still an um, amazing age of discovery. So uh, yeah, thank you. All right, well, have a great day, everyone. And we'll see you on our next session. Bye-bye.